David Hudson, as you all know, presently working at the University of Nashville School of Law, previously uh, was an integral part of the First Amendment Center. Uh, and he's, as you heard last night, uh, been very, very instrumental and very involved, in particular with uh, students' rights. And he's written several books uh, relating to that. And so without further ado, I'd like to present uh, Dr. David Hudson and uh, uh, enjoy your listening while you're eating. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you about student rights. It's something that's near and dear to my heart. And I'm just so grateful to be able to present alongside Mary Beth, John, and Kathy, who are not only First Amendment heroines and heroes, but I, I, I consider them friends, so it's just such an honor. I teach First Amendment classes at the National School of Law and, and, and Vanderbilt Law School, and one of the ways that I like to approach the First Amendment is uh, a lot of times I'll use a lot of acronyms, because First Amendment law is, is, is pretty complicated. There's a lot of different tests, there's a lot of different rules, and while there are some great general principles, it can get a little complicated particularly on where to draw the line between protected and unprotected speech. And one of the concepts that I like to ad address is the so-called three C's. Content, category, and context. All three of those are very important in modern free speech jurisprudence. Now let's talk a little bit about content. I'm so glad that Mary Beth mentioned Thurgood Marshall. Because I think that Thurgood Marshall is probably one of the most underappreciated justices on the First Amendment. Generally, when we think about the First Amendment, we often hear about Oliver Wendell Holmes or Louis Brandeis or William Brennan. Justice Thurgood Marshall was a consistent defender of free speech. It didn't matter if it was the free speech rights of students, the free speech rights of public employees, or even the free speech rights of prison inmates. He was a consistent defender of the First Amendment. And he articulated in 1972 what I consider to be the seminal statement about content in free speech. So, but above all else, the First Amendment means that the government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. I refer to that as miscellaneous, M-I-S-C. Government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. Now in First Amendment law we have a special subset of content discrimination and that's what Mary Beth also has already referred to, viewpoint discrimination. Viewpoint discrimination is, in the words of Justice Anthony Kennedy, an egregious form of content discrimination. Content discrimination being you can't have political speeches in the public park. Viewpoint discrimination goes further, saying that you allow the speaker of one political party, but not the speaker of another political party. The Tinker case is important for the advancement of the content discrimination principle for reasons that John and Mary Beth already mentioned. The black armband, which was associated with a political viewpoint, was singled out for censorship. That's content discrimination. And as the United States Supreme Court has made clear in case after case, content-based restrictions on speech are presumptively unconstitutional. Now the second C of the three C's is category. One way to understand First Amendment jurisprudence is to try to identify whether speech falls into an unprotected category or not. Is the speech a true threat? Is the speech fighting words? Does the speech incite imminent lawless action? Is the speech obscene? 
Is the speech defamation or libel? The history of free expression can be judged by looking at these unprotected categories of speech and seeing how they have narrowed over time. So for example, obscenity, which may not be a topic you want to discuss too much in your classes, but uh, obscenity used to be used to silence publishers of D.H. Lawrence novels. Obscenity prosecutions were brought against those who engaged in religious blasphemy. Today, obscenity prosecutions are generally reserved for the hardest of hardcore uh, pornography, usually pornography with, a, with a, a violent edge to it. Fighting words. Words which by their very utterance inflict injury or cause an immediate breach of the peace. Walter Szaplinski, the famous case, Szaplinski versus New Hampshire in 1942. Walter Szaplinski, a man of the uh, Jehovah Witness, who allegedly was denouncing other organized religions as a racket. Other citizens were complaining about him. When the marshal came up, Marshal Boering, he referred to him as a fascist and a racketeer and had a little profanity uh, added on to that. That was deemed to be fighting words. But what has been done in the law, right, with the famous Cohen versus California case, which came just a couple years after the Tinker case in 1971? One man's vulgarity is another's lyric. Right? allowed uh, uh, Mr. Cohen to wear a jacket that said F the draft in a Los Angeles County courthouse. The government argued that was fighting words. And what did the U.S. Supreme Court say? Something can only be fighting words if it's directed at a particular individual. The category's been narrowed. Earlier, Professor Allison was talking about clear and present danger and talked about how Justice Holmes artic initially art referred to the clear and present danger test in Schenck versus United States in 1919. He changed course in Abrams in his dissent. Ultimately, that concept of clear and present danger is encapsulated today by the Brandenburg test, right? Incitement to imminent lawless action. That's why a lot of times people can engage in very hateful speech. The missing element is imminence. Not only does it have to encourage unlawful action, but it has to lead to uh, unlawful action imminently. It's that temporal context that's important. The Tinker case is important with regard to category because this silent, passive political speech did not fall into any of these unprotected categories. Some may have been offended by an anti-war viewpoint, but these silent, passive political armbands were not targeted at a specific individual. It was to the world at large. So there's no way it could fall under the rubric of fighting words certainly didn't incite imminent lawless action. Right? Now the third C, and is the one that's most relevant to us today in talking about student speech, is what I like to refer to as context. The United States Supreme Court has developed special bodies of law related to specific context. In other words, student speech jurisprudence, public employee speech jurisprudence, prison inmates, and members of the military. So when I use the term context, I'm talking about the status of the speaker. In Justice Abe Fortas' opinion in Tinker versus Des Moines, he did say that we have to interpret these rights in light of the special characteristics of the school environment. All right? It's a school case. So because it is a school case, 
The Tinker case is the case. It is still the seminal case on student speech K through 12. Now let's turn our attention a, a, a little bit more closely to what uh, the Tinker case is about. We've already, well, we've already heard about what it's about. But let's talk a little bit more about the standards that came out of the case. And the term that usually gets bandied about with that case is substantial disruption. And as Mary Beth said, that's a case that was articulated out of the Fifth Circuit in Burnside versus Byers, the Freedom Buttons case out of Mississippi. What is a substantial disruption versus a minor disruption? What is a substantial disruption versus a disruption? And do school officials have to wait for an actual disruption? The language in Justice Forrest's opinion is not entirely consistent because at one point there's a passage that talks about just substantial disruption and then there's a passage that has been interpreted to mean reasonable forecast of substantial disruption. Our courts have focused on the term reasonable forecast of substantial disruption. Saying that School officials don't have to wait for an actual full-blown disruption. So if there is, for instance, significant history of racial tension or racial violence in a school, that could be interpreted to be a reasonable forecast of substantial disruption. What Justice Fortas was clear about, however, is that school officials may not rely on undifferentiated fear or apprehension of disturbance, which is not enough to overcome the right to freedom of expression. So let's talk about how the courts have dealt and grappled with this reasonable forecast of substantial disruption. Briefly mention a case out of my home state, Tennessee. And this was a case that began actually, I think, in 1970. We know that Brown versus Board of Education was decided in 1954, Brown two a year later, and they used that infamous phrase, with all deliberate speed. <laughs> and we know that courts focused, or I mean, leaders focused much more significantly on the adjective than the noun. It was very deliberate, the integration of schools. And so Chattanooga, Tennessee was really not an exception, particularly for the South. It took a long time to integrate the schools with this focus on deliberate. But the schools got integrated, and there was a fair amount of racial tension at this school. Their uh, football games had to be canceled. School itself had to be canceled several times there was a lot of racial conflict, racial tension. In that context, student Rob Melton wore a Confederate flag jacket. Now, whether one interprets the Confederate flag as a symbol of heritage or a symbol of hate, it's a very divisive symbol in many school districts and has led to a significant amount of racial tension. The 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in a case called Melton versus Young said that because there were a lot of race-based incidences of violence that school officials did have the right to prevent student Rod Melton from wearing the Confederate flag jacket. Why? Because they could reasonably forecast that the wearing of that Confederate flag garb would create a substantial disruption of school activities. Now contrast that with a case out of Kentucky many years later, Castorini versus Madison County. A couple students went to a Hank Williams Jr. concert and bought some t-shirts. And on those t-shirts was a picture of the Confederate flag and they wore 
the t-shirt to school. Their friends really didn't say anything. Most students really didn't say anything. But a public school teacher didn't like the fact that the Confederate flag was on there. Tells an assistant principal. The disciplinary process gets rolling. And the students aren't allowed to wear the, the t-shirt and are told if they continue to wear the t-shirt they could be suspended. That case actually also goes up to the 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. And that court ruled that there was not a reasonable forecast of substantial disruption based upon the trial record. And in that case, the attorneys actually brought forth several classmates of the students who wore the t-shirts, students of all races, who testified that they didn't really have a problem with this concert t-shirt. That having the Confederate flag among many other images in the shirt just didn't bother them. So you can see with regard to one particular symbol, not only is there a conflict among the different circuit court of appeals, there's a conflict in the same circuit court of appeals depending on the facts. In other words, determining what is a reasonable forecast of substantial disruption is a very contextual, factually dependent process. Now, I will tell you with regard to the Confederate flag, the bulk of the cases have found that school districts do have the authority uh, to regulate Confederate flag garb. If they can point really to any sort of racial tension or violence in the school. I wanted to talk about a case that, that Mary Beth has also brought up, the Dariano case. The American flag t-shirt case. Where about five or six students wore t-shirts of the American flag on Cinco de Mayo. They were told that they could not wear that t-shirt because the wearing of that t-shirt on Cinco de Mayo might cause problems at school. Lawsuit was filed. It goes up to the 9th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. The 9th Circuit actually ruled against the students saying upon, based upon the information that the assistant principal had at that time, there were enough facts in there to create a reasonable forecast of substantial disruption. A lot of people didn't like that case because they found it very strange that students could not wear a t-shirt with the American flag on it. To Google Dariano disruption, tinker, you'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of articles on that, on that case. I think it's a good example to discuss with, with students. A related question about disruption and what is a disruption is how far does the reach of school authorities reach? What about speech that is actually created off campus but, it, but is then brought onto campus and there are allegedly some significant ripple effects of that expression? And we had a case that many of us in the First Amendment community thought that the United States Supreme Court might take. And you may have read about this one as well. Bell versus Itawamba School District. Another case out of Mississippi. Involving a student named Taylor Bell, who in addition to being a student, was a rapper who rapped under the name T. Bizzle. Taylor Bell heard complaints from several of his female classmates that two coaches, two PE coaches, were making sexually inappropriate remarks to them. Uh, and so Taylor Bell decides to do something about it. He goes to the music studio off campus 
and he creates a rap song about these coaches sexually harassing these female students and about how wrong it is. Now, some of the language in the song is a bit hyperbolic, and some of the language is very frank. There's some profanity, uh, there's some very negative comments about these two coaches, etc. Well, somehow, the lyrics of this song, because Bell posts it on Facebook and YouTube. Well, the intended audience of that communication is the school community, so kids are talking about it at school, the coaches hear about it, the wife of one of the coaches hears about it, and she's not very happy, and she calls her husband, and the husband goes and complains to school officials. Mr. Bell is then eventually expelled from school for allegedly uttering a true threat against school officials and for engaging in expression that is substantially disruptive of school activities. Now the case, he later files suit, the case bounces around in the federal courts and we got three different rulings. A ruling by the federal district court judge, a ruling by a three-judge panel of the Fifth Circuit, and then we got a ruling by all of the active sitting members of the Fifth Circuit, what we call an en banc ruling. And ultimately, Mr. Bell lost his case. Why did he lose his case? The majority recognized that his speech was really not a true threat. That's something we have to talk about in school jurisprudence, particularly with our post-Columbine consciousness. When does student speech constitute a true threat and when does it not? But on the facts of this case, the court looked at the entire context and felt that it really was a song. He was not intending to threaten these coaches. Why did he lose then if his speech was not a true threat? The school, or, I mean the court, or most members of the court, the majority of the court felt that school officials could reasonably forecast substantial disruption from this song. Now in determining this calculus of substantial disruption, the majority of the court said we could focus upon the impact upon teachers. The fact that one of the PE teachers felt it was much more difficult for him to conduct class, that was deemed to be substantially disruptive by the Fifth Circuit majority. Now there were several judges who dissented in that case and they made several points. One point that they made was that Mr. Bell in one sense was a whistleblower. He was blowing the whistle on inappropriate conduct by certain school officials and he ought to be getting some credence for that. Another judge hinted the fact that there may be some sort of bias against Mr. Bell's particular genre of music. That he's being punished because he expressed himself through the medium of rap music. We thought in the First Amendment community that this was the case. You may have read about in the New York Times there was a, a piece where several f actually famous rap musicians signed on to an amicus brief urging the U.S. Supreme Court to take the case. Several other free speech groups signed on to different amicus briefs. And there's a circuit split on this. The federal circuits are divided on how to determine and analyze off-campus online student speech. 
And we know under Rule 10 of the rules of the U.S. Supreme Court, a key determining factor in determining whether the U.S. Supreme Court will take a case is whether there's a circuit split. But alas, uh, for at least the fifth case, the United States Supreme Court declined to take the case. So what are we left with? Well, we're left with a smorgasbord of different legal standards with regard to off-campus online student speech. There are a few courts, and admittedly it's a minority, but there are a few courts who simply say that if it's off-campus speech, if there's really not a substantial nexus between the off-campus expression and the school, it's just beyond the purview of school officials to do anything about it. <coughs> now those courts that follow that follow a one of my favorite little student speech cases from the state of Maine called Klein versus Smith, which I'll mention just briefly. Students tend to like this case. Um, although it's, it, you know, the, it may not be the greatest case, but it's, it's a funny one. Uh, Mr. Klein was quite upset at one of his school teachers, didn't like him. So when the teacher comes to a restaurant about two or three blocks from campus, Mr. Klein decides to engage in his own form of expression, which was not as good as wearing the black armband or writing a, a effective school editorials. He gives him the middle finger salute, flips him off. And the teacher obviously is upset. It's not pleasant to be flipped off. Goes and reports it to an assistant school principal. And it ends up that uh, Mr. Klein gets a 10-day suspension. <coughs> Federal District Judge Gene Carter begins his opinion with a poem from Samuel Johnson and ends up saying that while he doesn't really like the fact what Mr. Klein did, that the actual impact upon school was far too attenuated from the quote, digital posturing of this splenetic, ill-mannered little boy. <laughs> In other words, it was off campus, and it's a matter of parental discipline, or if he crossed the line into our criminal statutes, it may have been a matter for the authorities. Now that's one view. It's off campus. Let's not worry about it. Somebody else needs to deal with it. Most courts have applied the case. Most courts have applied the Tinker Standard. They say, well, if there is some sort of nexus or connection between this off-campus conduct and it has a tangible impact on the school community, then we will apply reasonable forecasts of substantial disruption. So how does this work? Well, in Pennsylvania, we had a case where a kid really didn't like his English teacher, posts a lot of negative stuff about his English teacher, and then also posts, I'll pay $20 to somebody to knock her off. Um, it was pretty clear that it was rhetorical hyperbole, that he was not actually trying to pay $20 for an assassination. <laughs> but the teacher suffered a significant emotional distress and actually missed most of a semester of school. The uh, Supreme Court of Pennsylvania applying the Tinker Standard said that in this context there was a reasonable forecast of substantial disruption. School wins. Student loses. Another case out of the state of Missouri involved a student who did not like his principal uh, and also didn't like another teacher and so he gets online and says some unflattering things about them. The principal learns about it calls the student into his office, did you post this? Yes, I did. Suspension. No investigation, no determination, just immediate suspension. In deposition, lawyer asks the principal, did you suspend this student because you were offended by this speech? Yes, I did. Federal District Court in Missouri, and Besink versus Woodland Four Community School District says, disliking student speech is not an acceptable justification for limiting it under Tinker. 
Different result, same application. We apply this reasonable forecast of substantial disruption. How can we say there was a reasonable forecast of substantial disruption when the principal really didn't engage in any uh, uh, under, uh, investigation of the facts? He just immediately had a knee-jerk reaction that this is offensive. A third standard that some courts use is they rely on a case that John and Mary Beth also mentioned, the uh, Bethel School District versus Frazier. Last opinion ever written by Chief Justice Warren Burger, July 7th, 1986. Matthew Frazier with his sexual indole speech before a student body of about 600 students. What's the rule that comes out of the Frazier case Public school officials can prohibit student speech that is vulgar, lewd, or highly offensive. Now, Chief Justice Roberts later actually said something about that highly offensive part, but the Frazier rule is generally no vulgar or lewd speech. In explaining this to my students, I like to quote a, a passage from Judge John Newman of the Second Circuit. In a student speech case, he had a great phrase, I thought. He said, the First Amendment gives a public school student the right to wear Tinker's armband, but not Cohen's jacket. Right? You can wear the silent, passive, pure form of political speech, the black armband, but you can't go around wearing T-shirts with F, uh, uh, T-shirts with the mess with the F word with the F bomb. Some courts have focused on the very negative speech that occurs on Facebook or social media and have applied the Frazier rule. If the student speech is vulgar or lewd, it can be prohibited as long as there is a nexus or connection between the off-campus speech and the online expression. That's why both John and Mary Beth are both correct. Right? The right of non-disruptive political speech, the essence of tinker, that is still pristine good law. As John says, that is absolutely good law. It's still the case. It's still the standard. But Mary Beth is also right when she says that student rights have been eroded, right? Because these later cases, Frazier, Hazelwood, and Moores, all created what we call carve-outs. <coughs> Exceptions to the seminal standard. So we have a lot of questions in the community today about what is or not a reasonable forecast of substantial disruption. Let's also talk about another unanswered question, and that is the often forgotten part of the Tinker Test. When does student speech invade the rights of others? Or when does student speech impinge on the rights or collide with the rights of other students, as Fortis wrote? In the age of cyberbullying, I would submit that this is another great unanswered question that eventually the United States Supreme Court will have to address. You know, every state, I think every state, has anti-bullying policies. Um, in most states, it's a state law that says school districts shall craft anti-bullying policies. Most states have actually amended those anti-bullying policies to say you must include cyberbullying. And so now 20 states have actual criminal statutes to deal with cyberbullying. Now we had a decision that just came down this year by the North Carolina Supreme Court, a case called State versus Bishop where the North Carolina Supreme Court held that North Carolina cyberbullying statute was unconstitutional. Why? Because it was too broad and it was too vague. The two chief 
methodological tools of constitutional litigators are overbreadth and vagueness. <clears throat> problem, one problem with the North Carolina law is it had been interpreted to apply to annoying speech. Are we going to criminalize annoying speech? What is annoying to one is pleasing to another. It's that Justice Harlan phrase again, one man's vulgarity is another's lyric. If we're going to criminalize speech, it has to be a narrowly tailored, precise law. But back to the initial point. When does student speech impinge on the rights of others? We don't have a lot of answers to that question. A couple cases that I like to use that I think show a good contrast. One involves a student from California by the name of Tyler Harper. Tyler Harper had, or has, I assume, I don't know now, but he had religious object objections to uh, homosexuality. Was the phrase that was used in the opinion. Sincere religious objections to homosexuality. So he wears t-shirts uh, that advocate that point of view, including some quotations to the book of Leviticus. The Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals holds that public school officials can prohibit Tyler Harper from wearing this t-shirt to Poway Unified School District because his the expressions on his t-shirts invade the rights of gay and lesbian students, a discreet and insular minority in that school community, and talks about higher suicide rates among um, gay teens. Contrast that with the case out of Minnesota, Chambers versus Babbitt, where Elliot Chambers wears a t-shirt with the message straight pride. The school has, um, in his mind, gone too far in promoting or endorsing gay pride. So Elliot Chambers says, I'm going to wear a straight pride t-shirt. Federal District Court actually rules in favor of Elliot Chambers, saying he has a First Amendment right to wear his straight pride t-shirt. There's no evidence in the record that it created any sort of substantial disruption. Most people just laughed at it or scoffed at it. And there really wasn't a significant disruption of any sort. How do we cabin this invade the rights of others? It's so important now because almost every state has these cyberbullying policies. So we have a confluence of these two unanswered questions. What's the legal standard with regard to off-campus online speech and when does student speech invade the rights of others? The honest answer is it really depends upon what part of the country you're from and how your federal appeals court has analyzed a case that's somewhat analogous. Now let's talk about those carve-outs that I mentioned before and how the Tinker Standard has been changed in certain degrees. Remember that the Tinker case was decided by the Warren Court. Even though it's just one of nine, we often refer to the Supreme Court by the last name of the sitting Chief Justice. There's no doubt that Earl Warren, the former governor of California, headed the court from like 53 to 69. At that time, the Warren court created what it's most, probably most well known for creating a criminal procedure revolution. Right? Gideon v. Wainwright, Miranda, all these significant opinions. But the Warren court was also very essential in developing First Amendment doctrine through the vortex of the Civil Rights Movement. The court ruled that Julian Bond had a right to sit on the Georgia House of Representatives even though he was against the Vietnam War. The court ruled that Ben Elton Cox had a right to lead protesters down Louisiana streets. They ruled that Fred Shuttlesworth had a right to lead a march 
in the city of Birmingham that Dick Gregory had the right to lead a march in the city of Chicago. In Gardner versus Louisiana, the court ruled that the sit-in was a form of expressive conduct deserving at least some First Amendment protection. In other words, the civil rights movement led to the development of much fertile and fruitful First Amendment doctrine and principles. The court that decided Frazier was not the same court as the Burger Court. Richard Nixon had a significant impact on the U.S. Supreme Court. Why he became president and a lot of members of the court died and Fortas had to resign. He got to appoint four justices on the court in a very short period of time. Harry Blackman, uh, Lewis Powell, William Rehnquist. I mean, these weren't exactly liberal stalwarts. Composition of the court significantly changed. And that, I think, is part of the reason that explains the different result in Frazier. Now, it was a different case as well. Chief Justice Berger said there was a marked difference between the political speech of Frazier and the sexual speech of Matthew Frazier. But remember that Matthew Frazier was nominating a fellow student for elective office. Right? It was in the context of a student campaign. Justice Marshall, by the way, is dissented in Frazier, consistent defender of the First Amendment. We got the Hazelwood case in 1988, which you'll hear a lot more about in the next session. But suffice it to say that the Hazelwood case was decided by the Rehnquist Court. William Rehnquist was an associate justice on the Supreme Court who was so conservative that his law clerks gave him a, a Lone Ranger doll because he was dubbed the Lone Ranger because he had filed these solitary dissents taking the most conservative position on the court. Now he had a lot of good qualities too. I'm not bashing William Rehnquist. I actually wrote a book on the Rehnquist court. Um, he apparently was very fair in who he doled out opinion assignments to and he was a very efficient court administrator. But he wasn't exactly a great, what we would call, great free speech defender. And it was the Rehnquist court that ruled against Kathy in February of 1988, I believe. Or January of 1988. Anyway, the early part of 1988. Hazelwood decision um, was a significant curtailment of the Tinker Standard. It created this whole new thing for school-sponsored student speech. Morse v. Frederick decided in 2007. Bong hits for Jesus. That was decided by the Roberts Court. In that case, Justice Clarence Thomas wrote a concurring opinion in which he argued that Tinker ought to be overruled. That's terrible. <laughs> What happened to stare decisis? I mean, well, you know, sometimes I, I, I believe, you know, a lot of us, if we're honest, we believe in stare decisis when it suits us, and sometimes, you know, there's really bad precedent that needs to be overruled. But Tinker is a great ruling. It doesn't need to be overruled. Thomas's opinion, now, in fairness to Clarence Thomas, there are certain parts of his First Amendment jurisprudence that are actually very speech protective. He's actually the court's most strongest proponent of commercial speech or advertising. Uh, 1996, in a case out of Rhode Island, 44 Liquor Mart versus Rhode Island, he said, I do not see a philosophical or historical justification for treating the suppression of truthful non-commercial -com uh, speech any differently than the regulation of non-commercial speech. But with regard to student rights, that's a bad opinion. The point is, the, the Warren Court is not the same thing as the Burger Court, the Rehnquist Court, and the Roberts Court. It matters who sits on the U.S. Supreme Court. I imagine we'll hear a lot about that from, from two certain people next few months. 
Okay, the last topic I want to talk about is something that I referenced last night. And that goes back to language and tinker where it says, it can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. About the same time as Tinker, only one year before, the United States Supreme Court said clearly that public employees, including public school teachers, have First Amendment rights. In the case of Marvin Pickering, a science teacher, who was upset at how his school district was spending money. Very upset about it. He didn't like the fact they were building a new football field and not finishing his science room classroom. And so he writes a letter to the editor of the Lockport East Herald. And he says things like, to sod football fields before finishing classrooms is putting the cart before the horse. He had some other choice words for the school district. When I lecture about it to students, I often refer to it as the listen to your spouse case because Mrs. Pickering said, don't send that letter, you're going to get fired. Did they live in the district? Was he a resident of the district he was writing about? Yes. He wrote that letter and he signed it as a citizen and a taxpayer. And guess what? He got fired. And he got blacklisted in the state of Illinois. He couldn't get a teaching job anywhere in the state of Illinois. He went to Chicago and worked in the Campbell Soup Factory for two and a half years while his case went up, went up to the um, Supreme Court. You may appreciate this, all, all of you. He said, when I asked him, when I interviewed him years later about the case, and why did he do it? He goes, I was born in Missouri, and in Missouri we have a spirit of independence. And we stand up for what we believe in in the state of Missouri. Well, the case goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and Marvin Pickering goes up to attend oral arguments in his case. And unfortunately, here's a little tour going on, and somebody asked the tour guide, what's, what's the court hearing today? Oh, they're hearing some case. I don't even know why they're taking it. It just involves some little old teacher from Illinois. Marvin Pickering didn't like that, but he liked the way oral arguments went, and he really liked what Thurgood Marshall was saying at oral argument. And what happened? In an 8-1 decision, with only Byron White dissenting, in an opinion written by Thurgood Marshall, the United States Supreme Court held that public school teachers have First Amendment rights. That in every case we have to balance the right of the public employee to speak out on matters of public concern or public importance against the employer's right to a disruptive free workplace. He said that public school teachers are most uniquely qualified to comment about issues in the school district. The Pickering case is kind of the tinker case for public employees. Now, the court, yeah. Did his union not defend him through this, or where was the union? Good question. It's, I, I don't know the answer to that from reading the court opinion. Um, they may have hired his attorney. Very good question. I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that his, he and his family suffered greatly, but it does have a happy ending. He won in the U.S. Supreme Court. It goes back down to the district court. He gets some back pay and they reinstate him and he gets to strut right back into their high school and he taught there until he retired many years later. <laughs> Now the court decided another case involving a public employee. This was not a public school teacher and his assistant district attorney by the name of Sheila Myers. Sheila Myers did not like things that were going on in the district attorney's office, which was led by Harry Connick Sr., the father of the famous musician, who was head of the New Orleans District Parish for 33 years, and he ruled that office with an iron fist. Sheila Myers was transferred to another division. She didn't like it. She distributes a 13 or 14 question questionnaire in the workforce. One of those questions says, do you feel pressured to support candidates that D.A. Connick wants you to support? 
first assistant district attorney says she's creating a mini insurrection in the office. Connick eventually calls her in. Did you distribute this questionnaire? Yes, I did. You're fired. She sues. Case goes all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Connick versus Myers, 1983. The U.S. Supreme Court rules in favor of D.A. Harry Connick Sr. When I interviewed him years later, he said, enough of this free speech foolishness. I had a right to determine who worked for me and who didn't. Well, the court didn't exactly say it that way. They said, look, the first thing we have to do is ask whether the public employee speaks on a matter of public concern, which is a matter of, uh, of political, social, or other importance to the community at large, as opposed to just a personal employee grievance. The court said most of her questionnaire was a employee grievance, but that one question about being pressured to work on public campaigns, that is speech on a matter of public concern, but what does the court do? They say, well, the DA had very weighty interest in not having an employee create disruption in the workplace. See, key to the Pickering case was that Marvin Pickering didn't talk about anybody he worked with on a day-to-day -day basis. In this public employee calculus, we ask, did the public employee speech disrupt close working relationships? The bottom line of all this is we had a consistent standard called the Pickering Conic Test. Prong number one, did the public employee speak on a matter of public concern or public importance? If they do, then we presume that it's protected and we balance it against the employer's interests. That's the legal test that we had for decades. And then what happened? The United States Supreme Court changed the game with a decision that I think is one of the most dangerous in recent memory in Garcetti versus Ceballos. <clears throat> Garcetti versus Ceballos, you may know the name Garcetti if you watch the O.J. Simpson uh, five-part series or the FX series, Gil Garcetti, it's Garcetti. He's the DA at the time. Richard Ceballos was a calendar deputy district attorney, which means he had supervisory authority over four other assistant DAs. He gets a phone call one day from an assistant district attorney who tells him, you've got problems in your case. Your case is dirty. Law enforcement official lied on a search warrant affidavit. Now Richard Ceballos would normally consider that to be posturing by a criminal defense lawyer but this happened to be a criminal defense lawyer who he respected. He tried cases against him and he believed him to be a person of veracity. So Richard Ceballos conducts his own investigation and comes to the awful conclusion that indeed the defense attorney is right. There's perjured law enforcement testimony. So he writes a memo to his superiors saying the case ought to be dropped. Charges ought to be dismissed. It's dirty. Bosses say no. Richard Ceballos writes another memo. He ultimately gets subpoenaed by the defense attorney and testifies in the case. But as a result of his speech, he is reprimanded, demoted from the position of calendar deputy dis district attorney, and transferred to a, much, to a different location that gives him a much longer drive, which if you've ever had to drive a long way to work, you know what a hassle that could be. So in other words, according to Richard Ceballos, he is retaliated against for the, con for the content of his speech. Now, when the Ninth Circuit got this case, they applied Pickering Connick. Did Mr. Ceballos speak on a matter of public concern? Of course he did. Whether law enforcement officials are lying or truthful is a matter of imminent public concern. We very much care about that. The Ninth Circuit then balanced the employee's free speech interest against the district attorney's right to a disruptive, efficient workplace. And the court said writing a memo is not inherently disruptive. So they struck the balance in favor of Richard Ceballos. Case goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And it's argued twice before the U.S. Supreme Court. Why is it argued twice? Well, we had some justices leave and then one die. According to some uh, 
uh, Tony Morrow and some other most significant Supreme Court reporters, the court was allegedly leaning 5-4 in favor of Richard Ceballos. But Justice O'Connor leaves the court and Justice Samuel A. Alito Jr. comes on the court. The case is set for re-argument. The court comes out 5-4 against Richard Ceballos. And the court creates a new rule, which I quoted last night. When public employees make statements pursuant to their official job duties, the Constitution does not insulate them from, from discipline. It was Richard Ceballos' job to write memos about pending cases, ergo no First Amendment claim. It didn't matter to the court that Richard Ceballos was a whistleblower. It didn't matter that it's extremely important that we not have perjured testimony. What mattered was we want to defer to the efficient administration of, of, of uh, and the efficient delivery of public services. Garcetti versus Ceballos has dramatically changed the law for many public employees, including public school teachers. Why? Because they apply this official job duty rule. And some courts, the Seventh Circuit being one of them, has interpreted the Garcetti rule in the context of public employees to mean any classroom speech. It's your job. This is just the reason I don't agree with it. This is the reasoning of the court. Any classroom speech, it's your job to engage students in the classroom. So any speech in the classroom, classroom speech, is official job duty speech. And therefore, there's no First Amendment protection for it. Now, one of the things that Justice Anthony Kennedy said in his majority opinion in Garcetti versus Ceballos was, well, there's going to be whistleblower statutes, right? Well, we see how spotty statutory coverage is, right? How many anti-Hazelwood laws? Nine now? Eight, nine? Used to be seven? That's pretty spotty. Nine out of 50, that's not a, you know, I mean, that's great. That's great that we now have nine. But the point is, is that to rely on statutory coverage means you have to rely on the specific statutory code in a specific state. Garcetti dramatically reduced public employee speech. Give me an example of how this was just applied in the school context. Lincoln Brown, public school teacher in Chicago. Uh, is upset, he's teaching, and he's very upset that uh, some of his students are passing notes. So he pulls up the note, uh, and the note has the N-word on it. And Mr. Brown is not pleased to see that word on the piece of paper, so he proceeds to engage in discussion about the divisiveness of this word, and how this racial slur should not be used uh, in society. Unfortunately for Mr. Brown, the principal is walking around and he hears Mr. Brown use the word. Now never mind that it's very contextual how he's using the word. He's certainly not using the word as an invective. He's not using the word to denigrate people. He's using it as a teaching moment but he gets disciplined. Now he does challenge this, goes up to the Seventh Circuit. About a month ago, what did the Seventh Circuit say? The Seventh Circuit said, well, classroom speech, curricular speech, that's official job duty speech, Gar said he applies, end of First Amendment analysis. Now whether you think that Lincoln Brown should have ultimately prevailed or not, whether you think that it was not the best teaching moment to use, to short circuit the First Amendment analysis in that manner, I would say unnecessarily diminishes the free speech rights of public school employees and particularly public school educators. There's 
significant movement against the Garcetti decision and a couple federal appeals courts at the university level have said that there ought to be special protection for academic freedom. A concept the Supreme Court has referenced, albeit vaguely, in the Sweezy case in 57 and the Kaishian case in 1967. What about your academic freedom rights? Shouldn't you have at least some level of academic freedom to teach that class in the way you see fit? Not according to several federal appeals courts. There's a term for this. It's called, when a public employee loses these cases, it's called being garcetized. Right? You've been subjected to this rule from the U.S. Supreme Court in Garcetti versus Ceballos. I've written quite a bit about the Garcetti rule. I did want to say that if you have any questions about any of this stuff, I, like Mary Beth and John, I'm very happy to, to do Skype. I'm very happy to send you PowerPoints. I'm very happy to answer emails. Roger's got all my contact info. This area of law I'm really passionate about. Love talking about it. Um, thank you so much for, for your time.